Welcome to Citizen Science, stories of science we can do together, brought to you by SciStarter. In this episode, how you can hug a tree, metaphorically, by collecting data for TreeSnap and Globe Observer trees. Also, South African teens monitoring streams, genius dogs with verbal skills, brave little fish that protect coral reefs, and a cosmic cat video. Well, we're trying out a new format in this episode with more news and test drives of different apps and um, sometimes reviews and recommendations for different um, resources, books, and gear. Please email us to tell us what you think at info at SciStarter.org. All right. Our hardworking trees suck up carbon dioxide, produce oxygen, and provide habitat for some of our favorite fellow organisms. And what do we do for them? Not enough, if you ask me. But we can change that by downloading TreeSnap and Globe Observer trees. Then we can help people like Ellen Crocker and Brian Campbell as they work to protect trees. Ellen is co-creator of TreeSnap. The idea behind TreeSnap is to make it easier to connect people who are passionate about trees to the researchers that are looking for special trees, trees that have something about them that uh, maybe makes them resistant to an insect or a pathogen that's wiping them out. They focus on 16 target trees that are threatened by pathogens like chestnut blight that wiped out chestnut, like Dutch elm disease that wiped out our elms. And people have been looking for those trees that have you know, something special about them, hoping that that could be part of the future of bringing those trees back. All right, we'll post our full interview with Ellen so you can learn more about TreeSnap. Uh, but now let's take it out for a test drive. I've downloaded TreeSnap to my little iPhone SE. I've registered. And uh, while you can map any tree you want, they really prioritize their 16 target trees. And out of those, I think a white oak is going to be easiest for me to find around here. Um, now, if you're already pretty good at identifying trees, that'll really help you with TreeSnap. If not, they do have a great info button for each tree that's really helpful. Okay, I found a pretty good sized uh, white oak. I don't know if you can see it there. And uh, yeah, and so um, uh, it looks like it's like 70 or 80 years old, maybe, uh, maybe more. Um, I'm gonna just drop a pin to locate it, take its picture, and uh, I've got a tape measure with me so I can measure its circumference, and I'll then enter that. And uh, then I'll answer a few more questions about it, and uh, that's that. And I'm ready to track down another tree. So I hope you'll try TreeSnap yourself and, and let us know what you think. Now, if you are the type of person who, like me, looks at a tall tree and wonders, how tall is that tree? Well, then you are also the type of person that Brian Campbell and his team at NASA is looking for. Brian runs the Globe Observer Trees Project, and he told me that they need as many people as possible to use the Globe Observer app to record tree height, because while several NASA satellites, plus the International Space Station, are right now measuring the height of Earth's tree canopy, they still need us ground dwellers to add our own measurements because even though the satellites are super technologically advanced, they won't be able to see every single tree because there's things in, in the atmosphere like clouds that can get in the way, things like that. So we need those ground-based observations. So we have the space base from NASA, and then we have ground-based observations from students, teachers, volunteers out there doing you know, tree height measurements from the ground. Trees capture carbon dioxide, so monitoring their growth is critical to studying Earth's atmosphere. You know, tree health is super important, um, and tree height allows us to, you know, figure out that tree health as well. But then, you know, more specifically on the science side of things, tree height helps scientists understand basically the biomass of an area, or basically, you know, how much living organisms or anything are within a particular area. That helps us understand our planet's carbon budget.
Here I am in the beautiful California Navarro Redwood Forest. I've downloaded the NASA Globe Observer app and I've clicked on trees. All I have to do is stand and aim the phone at the base of the tree, then tilt it up and aim it at the tippity top of the tree. And faster than you can say Pythagoras, it's gonna calculate the height of the tree. And then I just send that on to NASA. But before I say goodbye to my tree, I need to hug it. Not only to show my appreciation, but to slyly measure its circumference to get its BMI body mass index to see if my tree is a fat, a medium, or a skinny tree, because that's going to tell NASA how much carbon it's capable of storing. All right, there's a lot of trees out there and they're not going to measure themselves. So I hope you can download this app, help NASA ground truth their satellite information, and help monitor climate change on Earth. And now, citizen science news from around the world. In the South African township of Mpothameni, northwest of Durban, young people are participating in the EnviroChamps program, monitoring stream quality while they learn new skills. Sponsored by UNICEF and operated by a South African group called Ground Truth, EnviroChamps has 500 youth members. The young citizen scientists measure stream turbidity and flow rate and sample the stream for macroinvertebrates like dragonfly larvae and water striders. Their presence or absence is a standard measure for stream health. The youth upload their data using a mobile app that tracks stream health data from around the world. They then use the data to identify sources of pollution and share their findings with ward counselors and other officials who have the authority to address the problems. The work not only improves the environment, but can also prevent outbreaks of cholera and other diseases. You can check out their work at EnviroChamps. In other news, is your dog a genius? If so, researchers at Jotfuss Lorenz University in Budapest want to know. Some dog owners have long reported that their pets understand dozens of words, but scientists haven't been able to find enough of these dogs to see what makes them special. In the journal Scientific Reports, cognitive ethology researcher Shaney Dror and her colleagues report the results of a five-year social media campaign searching for these genius dogs. They found 41 exceptional canines and tested the highest performers in online snout-to-snout -snout competitions. Your dogs to Sonic in three, two, one, go. Guys, Sonic. Sonic. Over half the genius dogs were border colleagues. Colleagues? <laughs> Over half the genius dogs were border collies. They might have been colleagues, but the other half featured a wide range of breeds, including German Shepherds, Corgi, Poodle, mixed breeds, and others. Further research will require more dogs, so if you think your pooch has what it takes, go to GeniusDogChallenge.com and fill out a survey. Your dog might turn out to be the next canine Einstein. Well, if you're a fan of underwater nature films, and who isn't, you've probably seen tiny cleaner fish nibbling parasites from the gills and gaping mouths of much bigger fish. Fish who could easily make a snack of the little guys, but instead just submit to them gratefully. University of Lisbon marine scientist Jose Ricardo Paula and his colleagues told me that this relationship is more than just a sweet fish story. Cleaning stations operated by teams of these colorful wrasses could be critical to the health of the entire coral reef system. Remove them and all of the fish of the reef suffer. So we know from experiments that were done in, uh, in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, if you remove these fish from the ecosystem, you have uh, such a big drop in diversity and abundance uh, that that translates to a pressure similar to overfishing. We see like fish get smaller, there's less fish, there's, they are less diverse. Um, they have some physiological problems too, uh, and they're obviously there's more parasites to them. With a major grant from the Luso American Development Foundation, he and his team are expanding the research done at the Great Barrier Reef to look at wrasse cleaning stations all over the world. Their work relies on data gathered by recreational divers participating in a citizen science program that you can find at SciStarter called Reef Life Survey. 
so this new project that we're developing, uh, supported by FLAB, um, the idea is to use, um, so there's this big data set created by Reef uh, Life Survey, which basically uses trained divers all around the world. They're most, they mostly started in Australia, but now you can have them in, uh, you have data from 55 different countries. Uh, and the idea is to use, um, so these divers go to the, go underwater and do transects and do fish counts. And the idea is to try to understand these fish counts over the years, if places that have cleaner fish are actually more diverse and more abundant uh, with, other, with other fish and what's the general um, effect of having cleaners around the world. Because without citizen science, to have data so global like this would be completely impossible. He adds that in many areas, the populations of these wrasses have plummeted, mostly because they're collected for the home aquarium trade. So don't buy them. I know they're so cute and reasonably priced, but just don't do it. Don't buy them. Now, if you're a recreational diver in waters that have clean wrasses, consider joining the Reef Life Survey Project at SciStarter.org and help scientists learn about these fearless little fish performing an enormously important job. And finally, NASA now has the ability to transmit cute cat videos through millions of miles of space in stunning high definition. It stems from a historic collaboration between NASA and a house cat named Taters. We got Taters? We got Taters. Yay! <laughs> the achievement removes a chief obstacle of human space exploration, namely the fear of missing out on irresistible trending TikTok videos. As a side benefit, NASA notes that the technology can also be used to transmit scientific data from distant space probes. Well, that's all for now, but tune in next time for more citizen science project road tests, interviews with scientists and volunteers, and of course, citizen science news. I'm Bob Hershon. Thanks so much for listening and or watching. This podcast is brought to you by SciStarter, where you will find thousands of citizen science projects, events, and tools. It's all at SciStarter.org. That's S-C-I-S-T-A-R-T-E-R dot O-R-G. Our theme music is by Kevin Hartnell. Additional music is from Steve Combs, Jason Shaw, Komiku, Jangwa, The Joy Drops, and what I think must be pronounced Gagney Sharkoff, all via free music archive. Thanks. And thanks so much to you, the listener and the citizen scientist, for getting involved and making a difference. If you have any ideas you want to share with us, any things you want to hear on the podcast, or just some favorite cookie recipes, email us at info at Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>